Smith's examination of the Pentecostal Second Work Doctrine suggests it may have correlation with that error that was promoted by many of the Christianized Jews of the first century to the effect that apart from circumcision, one cannot be saved. By so asserting, the first century Jews brought with them the baggage of their doctrinal presuppositions, which interpreted the Mosaic ordinances literally, and which caused them to stumble along two avenues, that is, the failure to distinguish substance from symbolism, and secondly, the failure to rightly apprehend the significance and magnitude of newly revealed truth. The first century Jewish believers were not of the sort we would think of today when we use the term Christian Jews. Today, we do not use the term in any way as to imply the involvement of the Pentecostal baptism, and therefore the better term to apply to the first century Jewish converts to Christianity would be the Judeo-Pentecostals, given they most definitely were Pentecostal in doctrine and practice, given the events in Jerusalem upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the preaching of the Apostle Peter. As to 20th century Pentecost, its re-advent occurred in a time and place that had long since disabused rule and ritual as having significance in religion. But that is not to say that 20th century Pentecostals were beyond bringing the baggage of their own doctrinal presuppositions into the Pentecostal experience. What they brought was an experience that they loosely termed sanctification. And this was typically described by early Methodists and those within holiness circles as a crisis experience. The effect of which being the deliverance from sin and or otherwise a new power to resist the carnal nature. Given the wide variety of individual experiences, anxieties over receiving the experience, the wider array of doctrinal interpretation upon the experience, and even worse, vivid imagination and religious pretense. This sanctification experience, so called, was difficult to place doctrinally. Wesley called it sanctification, which sounded good enough for most. Some called it the baptism of the Holy Ghost, a designation which was resoundingly disproven through the events that occurred at Topeka and Azusa Street. Well, what was this experience that was described by so many 19th century Wesleyans? In retrospect, we know that it was not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But was it sanctification? While there is scriptural support, as we shall see in a later video, for an instantaneous redemptive event between God and the man, the term sanctification is rarely, if ever, applied to such a work. There are allusions to the church having been sanctified as if past tense. For instance, 1 Corinthians 6.11, And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And therefore, one might be inclined to conclude sanctification to have been an event that occurred sometime in the past. But there is much scripture that prevents us from this conclusion. For instance, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Paul refers to them as having been sanctified in Christ Jesus, even though he calls them carnal, and scolds that some do not even have the knowledge of God a term that alludes to the deliverance from sin's bondage. And therefore, Paul's use of the word sanctified must mean something beyond a single instantaneous event. In fact, when we research the term sanctification, we find that it seems to invoke eternal principles relating to calling and election. For instance, Acts 20, 32, the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Acts 26, 18, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Romans 15, 16, that their offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. The term becomes even broader when we consider such verses as 2 Timothy 2, 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, 
and meat for the master's use. Clearly, this verse would broaden the meaning beyond that of an instantaneous event wrought upon the man. The term is even applied to circumstances in which we can positively exclude it as representing a profound crisis experience. For instance, 1 Corinthians 7.14, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. The only possible conclusion is that sanctification is a greater and more expansive principle than can be restricted, restricted to time and place. Therefore, consider again the question, was sanctification an event that occurred sometime in the past for the Corinthian believers? Well, yes, in the sense that something eternal did occur the moment they believed the gospel. While a sanctifying event occurred the moment they believed, that is, at initial regeneration, the fulfillment and fruition of that moment was yet awaiting as far as experience. Nonetheless, Paul could say, it has been done. And this follows the principle that the moment we are truly justified, we have been, in the mind of the Father, glorified. And whom he predestined, that he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he glorified. Therefore, doctrinal support for instantaneous sanctification is lacking. But that is not to say that doctrinal support is lacking for an instantaneous sanctifying event. We might be given faith in a moment of time. We might be delivered from sin's bondage in a moment of time. But we should not confuse a sanctifying event with the broader principle of sanctification. And this is what Wesleyan Methodism did. This is what the Wesleyan Pentecostals did. In fact, in refuting the second work doctrine, William Durham discusses this strong tendency that we have to misname spiritual experience. William Durham writes as follows, The fact that someone had an experience has little weight with us, if that experience is not according to the Word of God. We do not doubt, generally speaking, that a person has had an experience, nor that it was a good experience. But we do believe that in very many cases people call their experiences by the wrong names. In fact, the mistake of the age is misnaming experiences. And this has resulted in many of us being compelled to acknowledge with shame that we have professed in all honesty that we have had some particular experience. And when God opened our eyes to see his word on the subject, we saw that we had an experience and called it by a very much larger name than we had any scriptural warrant for calling it. Today we accept that the circumcision of one's anatomy and the keeping of the Mosaic law is not required and has no value towards salvation. But less understood is the concept that even the keeping of the moral law has no justificational value, and is certainly not the source from whence the true gospel spirit emanates. But let us continue further still through this reasoning, and consider the question of circumcision in the spiritual sense for which it stands allegory. The Mosaic covenant of circumcision stood in type for a principle, a principle revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ as the work of the Spirit of God upon the heart of the believer. Paul tells us plainly what the rite of circumcision was a symbol for. He tells the Romans, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Therefore, while we commonly view circumcision as a physical act upon the anatomy marking one as a Jew, this is not the gospel meaning of the term. The gospel points to the work of the Spirit performed upon the heart as, wh as what is truly and prophetically intended by the principle of circumcision. When we read the account of the works of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, we find a notable difference in the circumstances attending the Pentecost received by the Jerusalem church and the Pentecost experienced by the nations outside of Jerusalem and Judea. We understand clearly that there is one baptism. Paul writes, 
there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Paul is not ambiguous on this point. This was a vital point to establish because of the tremendous diversity of other principles, such as gifts and offices and administrations and even personalities, etc. And therefore Paul continues on, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. While there is one spirit and one baptism, there are a variety of circumstances under which the baptism might be experienced. And the book of Acts gives various accounts of how the Spirit was received. And these range from the Jerusalem church's experience of having a painful work of circumcision that preceded the baptism, to the household of Cornelius, which simply had the Holy Spirit fall upon them as they listened intently to Peter's words concerning Christ. While their experiences differed in terms of the sequencing of God's work, nonetheless, they all experienced one baptism and were all made to drink into one spirit. While their experiences differed, we shall find the glory of Christ in a principle revealed in both experiences, being brought together and unified. While no painful work upon the heart is recorded pertaining to the Gentile Pentecost, the matter was different in Jerusalem, where upon hearing of their guilt as pertaining to Jesus Christ, now when they heard of this, they were pierced to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? The proper response to this piercing of their heart was what? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Clearly, a work of spiritual circumcision was performed on those in Jerusalem prior to their baptism in the Holy Ghost. However, while this operation had the effect of bringing repentance to some, it had the effect of hardening others unto perdition. And this is because the principle of circumcision presupposes faith in the heart. And what happens when the Holy Spirit's knife acts upon the faithless heart? Well, the work cannot be anything sanctifying. They become confirmed heathen, reprobated, and these react in violence against the truth. And therefore, when Peter bore witness in unison with the Holy Ghost, the surgical knife in use to work redemption performed just the opposite for some. We find that when they heard, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Likewise, when Stephen testified to the Jews who were in rejection of their own Messiah, the same anti-circumcision occurred. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Their violent reaction was the evidence that God had cast them off from being his people. And when these false Jews began to destroy the work of God in Galatia by convincing the Christians that they must be circumcised to be saved, what analogy does Paul use in alluding to their rightful fate? He writes, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Understanding that the principle of circumcision cuts both ways should provide us with some insight as to why it is so disadvantageous to refer to the experience loosely as sanctification. The term itself tends to lead towards presumption when those experiencing a crisis event whether sanctifying or not, misunderstand what has occurred. While spiritual circumcision is often a sanctifying event, it is not sanctification in and of itself. Further, the event is not sanctifying, at least not in the sense here intended, if wrought upon by those standing outside of faith's justification. In fact, the experience can actually lead to reprobation when there is not faith in the heart that is wrought upon, and therefore it is so profoundly crucial that faith abide in the heart prior to this deeper work of the Spirit. There must be a foundation of faith in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ.
covenant is an eternal bond of peace with God. If we are to walk in the deliverance from sin and to grow in the sanctification that is coming, we must understand and perceive our status before the Lord as squarely and non-ambiguously within his covenant, which is transacted experientially with them when I take away their sins. Paul does not say when he forgives their sins. Because of God's sovereignty to forgive sin via the work of Christ, we can be forgiven our sins upon confession of his name. On the other hand, our establishment comes on the day when nothing less than the blood of Jesus Christ can answer. This misunderstanding concerning the time, place, and conditions upon which the covenant of God is experienced is responsible for substantial trouble in the church, some of it destructive to the true work of God. In consequence of this confusion is affirmatively false teaching within the Pentecostal churches, which seems to have driven many devout believers into a legalistic form of religion, while discouraging many others from seeking God, and even worse, casting a shadow of illegitimacy over real experience which many believers have had with God. Belief in Jesus Christ is our means of sanctification, and so our salvation, as our justification is complete thereby. Sanctification is the coming to fruition of a faith genuine in the seed. Upon this, the Holy Spirit is allowed to build upon a right foundation using the same means by which the believer received the Spirit, that is, faith alone. The works, that is, born of faith, constituting the evidence thereof. To intrude upon this most basic principle via a doctrine that the Spirit works as any affirmation or seal upon our sanctification is a most grievous mistake. The lampstand model, as we constructed within an earlier video, clearly shows the existence of a second work, which would vindicate the Wesleyan teaching, at least in part. The second work appears at the second level intersection of the lampstand branches, joining the witness of the word with the witness of water, as involving the operation of sanctification. The point of intersection with the central candlestick would seem to represent the principle of circumcision, which we have discussed. Therefore, circumcision would seem to represent that event that particularly empowers the principle of sanctification. Despite its validation of a Wesleyan second work, the model actually rebuts the Pentecostal doctrine known as the second work or the third blessing, given that the baptism of the Holy Spirit occupies the lower intersection that forms the foundation of the lampstand, and which is joined within the principle of justification by faith. Therefore, the lampstand presents justification by faith with its attending principle of the baptism in the Holy Spirit as the foundation and containment for the work of sanctification. What this tells us is that circumcision and the work of sanctification stand within the kingdom of God as principles subordinated to the operation of faith in justification. The foundation must be entirely vicarious and wrought through the blood of Christ as the basis for our overcoming sin and eventually overcoming death itself. This analysis runs consistent with Paul's discussion of Abraham as typifying those justified by faith absent circumcision, which we should understand as a spiritual work upon the heart. He writes, For we say, faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it reckoned, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised, for he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that the righteousness that righteousness might be reckoned to them. Well, how can the sign of circumcision be said to be a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised? In his uncircumcised condition, he was justified by faith. That is meaning that something was lacking in his nature that was made up for 
by grace. But by grace, via faith, he did receive the seal of righteousness, represented in his eventual circumcision. Paul presents Abraham as representing those justified by faith to receive a promise culminating in true righteousness of heart. Can this reckoned form of righteousness also be considered salvation? Well, how could it be otherwise? What good is a reckoned righteousness if it is not saving? There are two ways to interpret the allegory of Abraham, only one of which appears logical. Unfortunately, the more illogical allegory has been generally accepted given the lack of Pentecostal teaching and experience throughout the centuries. Abraham is shown by Paul to symbolize God's purpose in availing his covenant to all men via the free gift of grace without respect to their circumcision. For the Spirit is given to them that believe, not to them that are circumcised in their natures. Further, the analogy of Abraham makes little sense to the Christian if it does not refer to spiritual circumcision, as a fleshly circumcision would simply be without meaning. James adds that such belief, as had Abraham, necessarily implies obedience to act in response to the promise. He writes, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Notice the particular form that Abraham's works took. Was it an outward demonstration of righteousness and keeping of the law? It was not. Abraham merely performed as God told him. He believed God to the point that he followed through upon God's promises. By Philip Morrow, we have in the scriptures the two expressions, believe the gospel and obey the gospel. Practically, they mean the same thing. For they who truly believe the gospel, obey it. Powerful in its simplicity is the truth spoken by Paul, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. By use of Abraham as a type for justification by faith, Paul was not merely invalidating the Jewish ceremony of circumcision, he was establishing a most basic spiritual truth for the guidance of the church, and that is that the righteousness of faith under the covenant of, of the blood of Christ is so vicarious to ourselves, and salvation is so entirely the product of faith, that belief in Christ stands as the only prerequisite to receiving the seal of God, which is life in the spirit and fellowship within the body of Christ. As the psalmist declares, the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. The particular love God holds for the gates of Zion is understandable in that it is this fundamental and powerful truth, justification by faith, that gives life to the dead, making possible the reconciliation of the sinner to his creator and growth in true holiness. This is also why the Lord hates any doctrine that would undermine the Spirit's work in this regard. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? The Levitical rite involved in the Feast of Pentecost provided as follows. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto this morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days. And ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And therefore the rite involved in Pentecost required that leaven be baked within the loaves that were to be waved. And we know that leaven stands allegory for sin. And therefore Paul exhorts the Corinthians, 
nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Pentecost was foretold by the prophet Joel, and Joel prophesied that not only would God pour out his spirit on all mankind, but he says, and even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And this is a reference to those still in bondage to sin, who by virtue of the vicarious atonement provided by Christ may receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. By servant, the prophetic meaning is the same as that spoken by Christ when he said, Verily, verily, I say to you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. The answer for those carnally driven servants of sin is a day known by God wherein his spirit brings unto them repentance and deliverance. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. The Feast of Pentecost does not require that any work go before to render the recipient holy, except for the favor of God upon them derived of faith. The feast is for the sinner. Pentecost is the free gift of God's Spirit imparted to humanity through the means of faith in the one whose blood purchased humanity from sin and death. And therefore the feast may be celebrated by all humanity by means of believing in the person and work of Jesus Christ for a full satisfaction of the requirements of a holy God. The righteous one did not die for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. And the Holy One did not die for the holy, but for the unholy. If the glory of God suffered the contradiction of the sin of humanity, and if Christ consented to carry the indignation of sin upon himself, and suffered the contradiction of humanity's sin against that holy nature, then his spirit is intended to be implanted in the heart of the sinner. If he that knew no sin was made to be sin for us, and the Son of God did consent to identify with the sinner, then the Holy Spirit does consent to dwell with the sinner, that the sinner might be made the righteousness of God. For he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him.